Hello, and welcome to the Phantom Toll Booth once again by Norton Juster, Chapter 16, A Very Dirty Bird. Up he went, very quickly at first, and then more slowly, and then in a little while, even more slowly than that, and finally... After many minutes of climbing up the endless stairway, one weary foot was barely able to follow the other. <sighs> Milo suddenly realized that with all his effort, he was no closer to the top than when he began, and not a great deal further from the bottom. But he struggled on for a while longer, until at last he stopped completely exhausted and collapsed onto one of the steps. I should have known it, he mumbled, resting his tired legs and filling his lungs with air. Oh, this is just like the line that goes on forever, and I'll never get there. You wouldn't much like it anyway, someone replied gently. Infinity is a dreadfully poor place. They can never manage to make ends meet. Milo looked up with his head still resting heavily on his hand. He was actually becoming quite accustomed to being addressed at the oddest times in the oddest places by the oddest people, and he was not at all disappointed. Standing next to him on the step was exactly one half of a small child who had been divided neatly from top to bottom. I... Pardon me for staring, said Milo after he had been staring for some time, but I've never seen a half a child before. It's point five eight to be precise replied the child from the left side of his mouth, which happened to be the only side of his mouth. I beg your pardon, said Milo. It's 5.8, he repeated. It's a little bit more than half. Have you always been that way? Asked Milo impatiently, for he felt that that was a needlessly fine distinction. Oh, goodness, no, the child assured him. A few years ago, I was just point four two, and believe me, that was terribly inconvenient. Uh, what is the rest of your family like? said Milo, this time a, a little bit more sympathetically. Oh, we're just the average family, he, he said thoughtfully. A mother, father, and a 2.58 children. And as I explained, I am the .58. It must be rather odd being only part of a person, Milo remarked. Oh, not at all, said the child. Every average family has 2.58 children, so I always have someone to play with. Besides, each family also has an average of 1.3 automobiles. And since I'm the only one who can drive three-tenths of a car, I get to use it all the time. But averages aren't real, objected Milo. They're imaginary. That may be so, he agreed, but they're also very useful at times. For instance, if you don't have any money at all, but you also happen to be with four other people who had $10 each, then you would have an average of $8. Isn't that right? I, I guess so said Milo weakly. Well, think how much better off you'd be just because of the averages, he explained convincingly. Think of the poor farmer when it doesn't rain all year. If there wasn't an average yearly rainfall of 37 inches in this part of the country, all his crops would wither and die. It all sounded terribly confusing to Milo. But for he had always had trouble in school with exactly this subject. There are still other advantages, continued the child. For instance, if one rat were cornered by nine cats, then on average, each rat 
I'm sorry, each cat would be 10% rat, but the rat would be 90% cat. If you happen to be the rat, you can see how much nicer it would make things. But that can never be, said Milo, jumping to his feet. Don't be too sure, said the child patiently. For one of the nicest things about mathematics, or anything else you might care to learn, is that many of the things which can never be usually are. You see, he went, he went on, it's very much like you are trying to reach infinity. You know it's there, but you just don't know exactly where. But just because you can never reach it, it doesn't mean that it's not worth looking for. I hadn't thought of it that way, said Milo, starting back down the stairs. I, I, th I think I'll head back now. A wise decision, the child agreed. But do try again someday. Perhaps you'll get much closer. And as Milo waved goodbye, he smiled warmly, which he usually did on the average of 47 times per day. Everyone here knows so much more than I do, thought Milo as he leaped from the step down to step. I'm going to have to do a lot better if I'm going to rescue the princesses. In a few moments, he'd reached the bottom again and burst into the workshop where Tok and the Humbug were eagerly watching the mathematician perform. Ah, you're back already, he cried, greeting him with a friendly wave. I hope you found what you were looking for. I'm afraid not admitted Milo. Then he added in a very discouraged tone, everything in Digitopolis is, is much too difficult for me. The math magician nodded knowingly and stroked his chin several times. You'll find, he remarked gently, that the only thing you can do easily is be wrong. And that's hardly worth the effort. Milo tried very hard to understand all the things he had been told, and all the things he'd seen, and as he spoke, one curious thing bothered him, among others. Why is it, he said quietly, that quite often even the things which are correct just don't seem to be right? A look of deep melancholy crossed the math magician's face, and his eyes grew moist with sadness. <laughs> Everything was silent, and in several minutes before, it, it was several minutes before he was able to reply at all. <laughs> How very true, he sobbed, supporting himself with his staff. It has been that way since rhyme and reason were banished. Quite so, began the humbug. I personally feel that. And all because of that stubborn wretch as as, roared the mathematician, completely overwhelming the bug, for now his sadness had changed to fury, and he stalked about the room, adding up anger and multiplying his wrath. It's all his fault! Well, I, perhaps if you would discuss it with him, Milo started to say, but never had time to finish. He's much too unreasonable, interrupted the math magician. Why, just last month, I sent him a very friendly letter, which he never had the courtesy to answer. See for yourself. He pulled out a copy and handed it to Milo, which read, 4738 4738-1919, 667-394017-5841. 62589 2 3 Seven, three. But well, maybe he doesn't understand the numbers, said Milo, who found it a little difficult to read himself. Nonsense, 
He bellowed. Everyone understands numbers. No matter what language you speak, they always mean the same thing. A seven is a seven anywhere in the world. <sighs> My goodness, thought Milo. Everybody here is so terribly sensitive about the things that they know best. Oh, with your permission, said Tok, changing the subject. We'd like to rescue Rhyme and Reason. Has Azaz agreed to it? The math magician inquired. Yes, sir, the dog assured him. Then I don't, he thundered again. For since they've been banished, I've never agreed on anything, and we've never will. He emphasized his last remark with a dark and ominous look. Never? asked Milo with the slightest, slightest touch of disbelief in his voice. Never! he repeated. And if you can prove otherwise, you have my permission to go. Well, said Milo, who had thought about this problem very carefully ever since leaving Dictionopolis. Then, with whatever Azaz agrees, you disagree. Correct, said the math magician with a tolerant smile. And whatever Azaz disagrees, you agree. Also correct, <laughs> yawned the math magician, nonchalantly cleaning his fingernails with the point of his staff. Then, each of you agrees that he will disagree with whatever each of you agrees with, said Milo triumphantly. And if you both disagree with the same thing, aren't you really in agreement? tricked yeah cried the math magician helplessly for no matter how he figured it still came out exactly the way milo had said splendid effort commented the humbug jovially exactly the way i would have done it myself and now may we go added talk the math magician accepted his defeat with grace nodded weakly and then drew the three travelers to his sides It's a, long and it's a long and dangerous journey, he began softly with a furrow of concern creasing his forehead. Long before you find them, the demons will know you're there. Watch for them well, he emphasized, for when they appear, it might be too late. The humbug shuddered in his shoes. <clears throat> And Milo felt the tips of his fingers suddenly grow cold. But there is one problem even more serious than that, he whispered ominously. What is it? gasped Milo, not sure that he even really wanted to know. I'm afraid I can tell you only when you return. Come along, said the math magician. I'll show you the way. And simply by carrying the three, he transported them all of the way to the very edge of the kingdom of Digitopolis. Behind them lay all the kingdoms of wisdom, and up ahead, a narrow path, rutted and worn, led toward the mountains into darkness. We'll never get the car up that said Milo unhappily. True enough, replied the math magician, but you can be in ignorance quick enough without riding all the way, and if you're successful, it will have to be step by step. But I would like to take my gifts, he insisted. And so you shall, announced the dodecahedron, who appeared from nowhere with his arms full. Here are your sights, here are your sounds, and here, <laughs> he said, handing Milo the last of them disdainfully, are, are your, your words. And most important of all, added the math magician, here is your own magic staff. Use it well, and there is nothing it cannot do for you. 
He placed in Milo's breast pocket a small, gleaming pencil, which, except for the size, was much like his own. Then, with a last word of encouragement, he and the dodecahedron, who was simultaneously sobbing and frowning and pining and sighing from four of his saddest faces, made their farewells and watched the three tiny figures disappear into the forbidding mountains of ignorance. Almost immediately, the light began to fade as the difficult path wandered aimlessly upward, inching forward almost as reluctant, reluctantly as the, trum the trembling humbug. Tok, as usual, led the way, sniffing ahead for danger, and Milo, his bag of precious possessions slung over one shoulder, following silently and resolutely behind. Uh, per perhaps someone should stay back and uh, to guard the way, said the unhappy bug, offering his services, but since his suggestion was met with silence, he followed glumly along. The higher they went, the darker it became. Though it wasn't the darkness of night, but rather more like a mixture of lurking shadows and evil intentions, which oozed from the slimy moss-covered cliffs and blotted out and sucked up the light. A cruel wind shrieked through the rocks, and the air was thick and heavy, as if it had been used several times before. On they went, higher and higher up the dizzying trail. On one side of the sh was... On one side, the sheer stone walls and the brutal peaks towering above them, and on the other, an endless, limitless, bottomless nothing. I can hardly see a thing, said Milo, taking hold of Tok's tail as a sticky mist engulfed the moon. Perhaps we should wait until morning? There'll be morning for you soon enough, came a reply from directly above, and this was followed by a hideous, cackling laugh, very much like someone choking on a fishbone. <laughs> Clinging to one of the greasy rocks and blending almost perfectly with it was a large, unkempt, and exceedingly soiled bird, who looked more like a dirty floor mop than anything else. It had a sharp, dangerous-looking beak and one eye. He chose to stare down with maliciously. I, no, I, I don't think you understand, said Milo timidly as the watchdog growled warning. We're looking for a place to spend the night. It's not yours to spend, the bird shrieked again and, f and followed it with the same horrible laugh. <laughs> that doesn't make any sense, you see, he started to explain. Dollars or cents! It's still not yours to spend! <laughs> the bird replied haughtily. But, but I didn't mean, insisted Milo. Of course you're mean! Interrupted the bird, closing the eye that had been open and opening the one that had been closed. Anyone who'd want to spend a night that doesn't belong to him is very mean! Well, I, I thought that by... He tried again desperately. Oh, that's a different story! Interjected the bird a bit more amiably. If you want to buy... I'm sure I can arrange to sell, but with what you're doing, you'll probably end up in a cell anyway. <laughs> that, none of that seems right, said Milo helplessly, for with the bird taking everything the wrong way, he hardly knew what he was saying. Agreed, said the bird with a sharp click of his beak. But neither is it left, although if I were you, I would have left long ago. N l let me let me try once more, he said in an effort to explain. In other words, you mean you have other words? Cried the bird happily. Well, by all means, use them. You're certainly not doing very well with the ones you have now. <laughs> Must you always interrupt like that? Said Tok irritably, for even he was becoming impatient. Well, naturally, he cackled. It's my job. I take the words right out of your mouth. Haven't we met before? I'm the ever-present word snatcher. And I'm sure I know your friend, the bug. 
And then he leaned all the way forward and gave a terrible, knowing smile. The humbug, who was too big to hide and too frightened to move, denied everything. Is everyone who lives in ignorance like you? asked Milo. Much worse, he said longingly. But I don't live here. I'm from a place very far away called Context. I don't you think you should be getting back? suggested Milo, holding one arm up in front of him. What a horrible thought, the bird shuddered. It's such an unpleasant place that I spend almost all of my time out of it. Besides, what could be nicer than these grimy mountains? Almost anything, thought Milo as he pulled his collar up. And then he asked the bird, Are you a demon? I'm afraid not, he replied sadly, as several filthy tears started rolling down his beak. I've tried, but the best I can manage is to be a nuisance. And before Milo could reply, he flapped his dingy wings and flew off in a cascade of dust and dirt and fuzz. Wait, wait, shouted Milo, who thought of many more questions he had wanted to ask. Thirty-four pounds, shrieked the bird as he disappeared into the fog. Well, he was certainly no help, said Milo after they had been walking again for some time. Well, that's why I drove him off, cried the humbug, fiercely brandishing his cane. Now, let's find some demon. Ha ha! That might be sooner than you think, remarked Talk, looking back at the suddenly trembling bug. And the trail turned again, and they continued to climb. In a few minutes, they'd reached the crest, only to find that beyond it lay another one, even higher. And beyond that, they could see several more whose tops began to be lost in the swirling darkness above. For a short stretch of path, for a short stretch, the path became broad and, and flat, at least, and just ahead, leaning comfortably against a dead tree, stood a very elegantly looking and well-dressed gentleman. He was beautifully dressed in a dark suit that was with a well-pressed shirt and a tie. His shoes were polished, his nails were clean, his hat was well-brushed, and a white handkerchief adorned his breast pocket. But his expression was somewhat blank. In fact, it was completely blank, for he had neither eyes, nor nose, nor mouth. Hello, little boy, he said, amiably shaking Milo by the hand. And how's the faithful dog? He inquired, giving Tok three or four good, strong, and friendly pats. And who's this handsome creature? He said, tipping his hat to the very pleased humbug. I'm so happy to see you all. Well, what a pleasant surprise to meet someone so nice, they all thought, and especially here. I wonder if you could spare me... A, a little of your time, he inquired politely, and help me with a, a few small jobs? Oh, why, of course, said the humbug cheerfully. Gladly, announced Talk. Oh, yes, indeed, said Milo, who wondered for just a moment how it was possible for someone so agreeable to have a face with no features at all. Splendid, he said happily, for there are just three tasks. Firstly, I would like to move this pile from here to there, he explained, pointing to an enormous mound of very fine sand. But I'm afraid all I have are these tiny tweezers, and he gave them to Milo, who immediately began transporting one grain at a time. Secondly, I would like to fill this well, or I would like to empty this well and fill uh, this other. But I have no bucket, so I'm afraid you'll have to use this eyedropper. And he handed it to Talk, who undertook to carry one drop at a time from well to well. And lastly, I must have a hole through this cliff, 
And, of course, here is a needle to dig through it. The eager humbug quickly set to work picking at the solid stone granite wall with the needle. When they had all safely started, the very pleasant man returned to the tree and, leaning against it once more, continued to stare vacantly down the trail while Milo, Talk, and the humbug worked hour after 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 h